There we go in recording. So officially welcome to this webinar. A um, uh, particular welcome to those who are joining us live this morning and just want to say uh, a big hello to those of you who will be watching the replay afterwards. Now, um, Sally and I have been really excited to be digging into this whole question of how do we know when our piano students are actually ready to take grade one. And as Sally's just been saying, um, we have been learning so, so much. We've been kind of looking at this from very, very different angles. And we've been curious to, to you know, we've been getting some really curious responses back as we're, as we're digging into these questions. So, um, Sally, I'm gonna let you kick us off and I'm gonna just pull up some of these slides that we've got. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, one of the questions is, you know, what is grade one? What is ready for grade one? Can you really tell? And in a way, you know, you can't because every student is different and they bring a whole different set of skills and, and uh, personalities to a piano lesson, which is what makes it so, so much fun, I find. Um, but I think there are a certain amount of um, uh, elements but actually you can say, yeah, if my student is able to do this skill or understand this concept, then that means that, yeah, they're on the road to actually start grade one preparation. Because I think sometimes, I don't know about you, but certainly in the past, I've been guilty of my students kind of just falling into grade one preparation almost by learning the pieces themselves. And I think both Sharon and I these days are big believers that um, grade one is sort of the icing on the cake, if you like, um, that all the, all the learning has to go on before they start the journey towards their grade one. So we've put together this seven point checklist to find out if your pupils are ready to start at working towards grade one. Um, so this is a question we quite often get asked, if by the, not by the pupil, then by the parents. When, can you go back one, Sharon? Mm -hmm. when, when will uh, I be ready to, take, to, to start learning grade one? I can see too many, we're too many, there we go, that's what I want to say. <laughs> um, when, will, when can I take grade one? And then temptation is to sort of say, well, we'll start looking at pieces, shall we? Um, I think that is probably the wrong angle to take. I think hopefully this checklist will help you to actually uh, be a, a little more considered than certainly I've been in the past. And what we really, really don't want is our grade one um, students who are at that level to spend a whole year learning a piece because can you imagine sending your child to school and in year four, they're given three books to read for the rest of the year? And it takes them probably an hour to read each book right the way through from beginning to end. And yes, it's got some difficult words in it. But would you just say, no, those are the only three books you can read this year. And the more you read them, then the better you'll get at those difficult words. Would we say that? Actually, I think we'd be quite aghast um, at a school that sent the children home with just three books for the year. So we build skills and concepts by going wide, yeah? By doing lots and lots of different things when they're reading. They will read, I don't know how many books, but loads of books anyhow, certainly a lot more than three. And by reading those books, they will gradually develop their reading skills. Okay, Sharon, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It's the way I was, was taught piano. And <clears throat> what happened was you take one year to learn your three grade one pieces. And then, of course, the interesting thing is that the moment you find out you've passed grade one, suddenly, somehow magically, you're actually grade two. If, you, if you're asked, you know, what grade level are you at? You're suddenly grade two. Um, and so on and so forth. That was very much my musical journey. And you know, you're kind of saying, how did that, how does that make students feel? Well, incredibly bored, you know, when you have only got that limited number. And it's, it's the challenge of getting those three pieces as perfect as possible. But of course, as, as teachers, you know, sometimes 
we have to accept that actually just getting a piece 70% of the way, provided it's actually we have helped the child learn whatever skill or concept it is, then we can move on because of course they may not be doing everything perfectly, but that's not quite the point. We can move on and we can develop and deepen skills and concepts through other pieces. And of course, that's when the motivation can rise because they do want to be learning in the same way that Sally has just used that wonderful illustration of they do not want to be reading three books a year. They do not want to be learning just three pieces a year either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sharon. And, you know, I, I've certainly inherited in the last two or three years, actually, a couple of taken on a couple of transfer students who've, who've been through this very thing. They, they've spent over a year learning a grade one piece. And as soon as they finished, the, the grade two pieces have been produced. So let's take you through these, these seven steps. And, you know, the, the seven steps are part of our grade one teacher's toolkit, which is, going, which is providing tried and tested solutions to common problems that we all, we all have. And this is one of those common problems isn't it when is a student ready so let's show you how actually we can break this right down and become just a little bit more um, aware of some of the um, elements that need to be in place some of the skills that need to be in place so shall I start off Sharon yeah go for it yeah so the first the first of these um, seven steps or seven skills is you know how well does your pupil um, understand and play simple time rhythms? So grade one pieces are going to be simple time. They're not going to be anything different. Um, the vast majority, um, well, we'll talk about that. In the, in, we'll talk about time signatures in a moment. But um, here we have got obviously three, four uh, flashcards. And if you caught me yesterday on the Tuesday teaching tips, you know, flashcards are really, really important because they extract the rhythm from the pitch. And as long as the pitch is there, the rhythm tends to take a secondary role. And actually, rhythm is a fairly primary aspect of music making. Without rhythmic flow and rhythmic understanding, then students are going to struggle. So taking flashcards like these three, four ones will really help them to understand the rhythm of, of the pieces. Can your students look at these rhythms? Can they count them? Can they collapse? Them? can they do that independently can they transfer them onto uh, a piece of music can they spot these patterns on a piece of music you know going back to my Tuesday te teaching tips yesterday I was talking about this secret code idea that, that Sharon actually introduced me to that I'm putting two of these flashcards and I had two of these very ones outside my door yesterday the students came in through the into the hallway they saw the rhythms they had to work out the rhythms by counting and they can either use rhythm language ta 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 ti 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 ta or if they're in metrical counting they can go one two three one and two and three and if the rhythm's right hey they get entry to the piano room goodness me does that start off the lesson <laughs> and with one of them um i'm thinking of young soph um she was doing the rhythm on the on the um, bottom bottom left, which is the ta ta ta, and I knew she was having problems with a piece called Sunken Treasure, which starts with that very rhythm. So that's the rhythm I used, and we were looking through the repertoire books, weren't we, Sharon, this morning to mm -hmm. see if we could find examples. What what have you got there, Sharon? For yeah, so if, if we're looking at rhythms in just this example um, of, of three, four time, I'm looking here, um, the flying trunk, which is a piece in LCM, grade one. Um, I know we haven't got the, the, any rhythm cards that we're showing here in the slides for two, four. But um, again, the same rhythm ingredients, the same concept. So um, crotchets, um, groups of quavers uh, and minims, the enchanted garden, uh, which is a grade one trinity. And I know, Sally, what I Shall I, I just play a bit of that flying shot? Shall yeah, I yeah, just play would... a bit of the flying trunk? Yeah. So, um, so this is the flying trunk. This is an LCM, um, which is... One, 
one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, yeah? So those are those three, four rhythms. You see, unless they've already understood those rhythms, they're not going to get the flying trunk. And that is a fairly basic rhythm pattern, really. That is not the difficulty in that particular piece. And, and I know that for, um, for me personally, what I find is that with, with rhythms, as basic as this in a grade one piece, I'm actually not wanting to be teaching the grade one piece and teaching these rhythms. I'm, I'm actually wanting the student to already, literally in, in that particular piece, to be able to just sit down and be able to tap yeah, one, yeah, two, three, yeah. and look at it. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. In Trinity, there's, um, there's a, a, a minuet by Reinagle, which is, um, has got those rhythm ingredients, but not quite in that order. Yeah, lovely, lovely piece. All right, should we move on to the next one, Sharon? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the next slide is oh yes, okay. And then so those are the basic <laughs> rhythms. <laughs> what about these? Then we've got these rhythms. And actually just having if I flick over a couple of pages just from that flying trunk at LCM is another um, flying, flying above the clouds this time. Mm -hmm. And for those of you familiar with this particular piece. Um, Sally, I know that you're seated there at the piano. Um, even if you literally just give us the first melody line there. Of which one? Flying of trunk. Flying, uh, flying above the clouds, which is on page. Oh, flying. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And this is where <gasps> By this Alan Bullard rhythm comes in. Okay. Sorry. And there we have it. You just hear yeah, that rhythm. One, two, and three. Yeah. Now, this may be a rhythm that your student are not, they're maybe not completely confident with at this point. But if you take our drift, it's like where they really need to have the previous, the blue cards, completely under their belt. Um, yeah. Because then there's just a little bit of learning. If they cannot, tap basic um, crotchet and groove rhythms then it's really going to be an uphill struggle and I know that was my experience when I was learning as a grade one everything was a, a, a tough steep climb up the mountain um, rather than me being up there and then just simply um, coming into a piece and with much joy as the way that I try and structure my teaching these days is where they have actually they have climbed the mountain and they, they look at a grade one piece, now that we've decided they're actually ready to start preparing for grade one, and they'll go, oh, yes, I can tap that rhythm. And they realize before too long, and it, if, you're, if you're looking through whatever book you have there in front of you, hopefully you have a, a book or a couple of books, whether it's ABRSM, Trinity, or LCM in front of you, and you flick through, and you can see that if they have these basic rhythms, I'm just even going to move on. These are, for example, typical rhythms that you will see in 4-4. In four four. These are 4-4 four four flashcards that they will actually go, yeah, I can tap the entire rhythm. And then mm -hmm. the whole experience yeah. means that there's no way that they're going to need to take a year to learn three pieces, more like a couple of months. Yeah. Yes. And that's where we really want it to be. That's where we want them to be, isn't it? I, I'm just going to say a word um, on the back of the dotted crotchets, because we've also got some coming up in the 4-4 uh, flashcards. And we've also got syncopation. Now, dotted crotchets, on the whole, is, as Sharon said, a more advanced rhythm. So you won't find that many examples of them at grade one you'll find far more at the grade two level but if as Sharon said the early rhythms aren't established dotted crotchets and quavers will be very tough indeed and um, Sharon could you just move us on to the dotted crotchets and quavers in full four there we go yeah. um, and it could be that your pupils actually always learn the dotted crotchet and quaver rhythm by rote 
for this level but then it's your job to come back to it post the exam and work on it in various other situations, okay? And the same with the syncopation, syncopata, ta, syncopata, ta. I've been working on this a lot with my students at the moment, the particular syncopation rhythm. And of course you do get it in, in the more jazzy pieces. And again, to me, even if they might have an understanding and be able to look at that card, sometimes it's hard to then translate it actually into a piece of music and really, really be able to clap and count it at this particular level. Um, I'm just looking at Mango Walk. And mm -hmm. it's so catchy, you see, the syncopation here, that it's almost easier just to catch it and work on it as a concept, as a separate thing. So this is a duet um, from the Trinity, and it's one, two, three. Sing, sing, ko, pa, ta, yeah. It, it, it is, it's infectious, that kind of rhythm. So again, there's a caution there. Yes, they can play that, but do they understand it? And it's the understanding that you need to develop with the use of things like rhythm cards in a slightly different way. Because can they count and clap it? If they can do that, then it means they can probably go off and use that in a new situation. Mm -hmm. So that's a word, that's your very first, really, uh, your very first part of this. Can they um, clap and count simple time rhythm? And I think it's about, it's about with being in any context. And that was my really big downfall when I started as a piano teacher and didn't know this. It was where they could play these rhythms correctly, within their grade one pieces, but they couldn't, they did not have the skill to be able to apply the same concept when it came up within a different piece, within a different context. And when I started developing my teaching so that I was actually teaching these skills and concepts so that they could recognize them wherever they find them. Wow, I mean, it just makes such a difference and just gives, a, our students are that really big drive of independence because they, 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 they look at a brand new piece, something they've never seen before, and they go, yeah, I know how to tap that rhythm. Yeah, and, and what, what it means is that the, the, the music and the pupils learning goes at the center of uh, the whole piano lesson and the exam experience. And as we said, the exam experience then just becomes the cherry on the cake. Um, the thing to say, yay, you know, you, you're there, not something to struggle towards. So the second thing, um, the second point to, to, to check off is how well does your pupil understand these particular time signatures, which is two, four, three, four, and four, four. And the vast majority, the vast majority of grade one pieces have that time signature. There is there are a couple of two two ones, and I have a feeling there's a three eight one as well. But the vast majority are in two four three four and four four. So one way you can do this is by um, either singing singing a piece. I mean, Sharon's got here double double this this double double that that and it's about the strong and the weak beat can they feel the strong and the weak beat can they do a double double this this double double actually i'm doing it double yeah like just doing that oh sorry pulling it out or um if we're doing um engine engine number nine maybe could they do a pattern of four Engine, engine number nine, running down the London line, yeah, with, a, with an action. And then that begins to translate into the pieces. And again, you might see if they know, if they can feel the rhythm. We don't have a three, four piece there, but um, we do have them, honestly. Um, there wasn't quite space on the page. So can they then feel or, and conduct you know, the four beats in a bar. So it could be, for example, who said mice? Can they put that same rhythm pattern to, see if you can do it. Knee, clap, shoulder, head. Knee, clap, shoulder, head. Knee. I know the sync is a sometimes off. Do, 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 yeah. So feeling that four in a bar. And then what I like to do, I don't know about anybody else, I like to teach them how to conduct 
yeah so that they feel a one two three four one and get them marching around get them moving so they really understand how the time signature is the and the meter it drives the music forward really really important part of playing a piece is understanding the meter of the piece and having a feel for the meter that goes beyond the rhythm sharon yeah absolutely it's i mean i remember back in the day when i was doing it it was Kind of just to get the, the rhythm and uh, and the right notes in the right order but of course it is so much more than that it's well beyond that yeah yeah because we're teaching them to be musicians yeah we're not teaching them to pass exams they have enough of this in their lives already um so uh whether you, it's an adult we're talking about here or whether it's a child or a teenager we're, we're helping them to become musicians to develop a love of music and we're trying to nurture the pianist within them and we want that that love to stay with them for their life yeah we don't want to put them off by making it so hard that they can't they can't that yeah. everything is a struggle and i think actually sally just what you've you've been um, alluding to there is is this that we we don't want them to because i'm sure that you have some point out there met someone who has said yeah, I actually do have a grade five certificate, but I couldn't play a thing if you asked me to. No. And that's not no. what it's no. about. We want them that if they're getting to that level, that they will be able to play to at least that level for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's what's important. That's what counts. Um, and actually, when you think about it, lessons are incredibly expensive if all they're left with is a piece of paper on, on, framed on a wall. You're, you're absolutely right, aren't you? Yeah. Um, you know, parents want value for money and they tend to equate value sometimes with the grade exams. But actually, maybe it's up to us, the teachers, to be the professionals in this and turn it around and say, yes, but, you know, the value is your son will still want to go and play the piano five years after he stopped learning it. That's the value. Or you can have a certificate on your, on your wall, but they can't play a single thing. Well, changes the perception of it, doesn't it? Changes yes. the perception. Okay, I think we need to move on, Sharon. I can see, should we have one more? Of, uh, oh, yes, this is a fun one. And then we maybe stop and, and um, take any questions. So if you've got questions or anything, just pop them into the chat box. That would be lovely. Yeah. Sharon. Absolutely. Okay. Um, love this. Third this checklist. Yes. Yeah, so this is um, number three. Can your pupil read and play scale, interval, and triad shapes with relative ease and confidence? Now, I don't know about you, but when I started teaching the piano, I had, um, I used mnemonics to get my student to read pitch. And in short, it was highly unsuccessful because you've got students who just continually keep counting up. And if you imagine what that does to the, the sense of flow in the music, it just, it hesitates it at every single note. So, um, we do something called um, working um, with landmark notes and then reading shapes and patterns. So, do you want to talk a little about a little bit about landmark notes? Okay, so I was doing this last night with a young with a young boy, and we were going on to um, the stave for the first time. Although actually, he's quite familiar with it from from various ways, and. Um, I these days and I haven't got any landmarks with me but we were as somebody in the community found a little set of toy landmarks like we've got the Eiffel Tower and we've got Big Ben and even before I'd said the word landmark he goes those are landmarks <laughs> oh you know how to say the right thing young man um, and so landmark notes are about helping students to know certain notes as an initial starting point and from those notes they can read the shapes and the pattern so think about the way that you read music when you look at a piece of music what do you see and what do you read okay just think about that for for a second what do you see and what do you read when you when you look and play a piece of music so when i play I don't have the names of the notes running through my head. You know, I'm not looking and going G, A, B, C, D. I don't even have D major triad going through my head or anything like that. 
I know all that, yeah, but the, the thing that I'm looking at are the shapes and the patterns, and I'm reading the scale patterns, I'm reading, you know, I'm reading shapes like that, I'm reading shapes like that, I'm reading shapes that are thirds, maybe fifths, maybe seconds, maybe fourths, and I've learned all those shapes and patterns over time so that I can respond to them instantly without having to think about it. Um, there is a whole video series about this, but um, I'll just continue to talk for, for a moment or two because it is a really, really important thing that when you teach mnemonics, just think about what it is you're teaching. To retrieve, if you say, what's the name of this note? And it's the B, let's say, in the treble clef, in the G clef, on the third line. Does the student look at that note when they use mnemonics and instantly work it out? Because that's the point, isn't it? They need to be able to look at that note and go B without thinking about it. What tends to happen with mnemonics is they go up. They first of all have to retrieve the mnemonic. Every green bus drives fast or whatever version of it it is or wrong version as it can be. And then they, because of course the treble and the bass clef confuse them. And then they count up, don't they? What every green bus. And then they have to think, what's the beginning of bus B? And there we go, we have B. So that's a three stage process at least, instead of a R, that's B. So the idea of the landmarks is that you work with the landmark note as a concept really intensively at the start. So they get used to reading um, treble G, as I call it, middle C, um, bass F and bass C in particular for me at the moment. But you know, which landmarks you use are up to you, but make it logical. Um, if you have one really good thing to do is to work out that, it, that all the landmark notes should be G's or F's or C's. And they all relate to the bass F clef or the treble G clef. And if you go at it, really, really, really um, steadily, as we say, my curious piano teachers, be consistent, be persistent. And I'm talking months, <laughs> not days or weeks, yeah, months, if not a year or so, going back to those landmark notes. And actually from those landmark notes, they read the shapes and the patterns. So what you've got here in front of you is pitch patterns reading from landmark notes on the whole. So you can see the very first one, this is reading from landmark note C. They don't need to know the names of the other notes, probably will, but we don't need them to instantly recognize them. I would get them to work them out, but they don't need to instantly recognize them. If you understand the difference, that comes in a different way that does. Um, the second one, here I'd be asking them, which is the landmark note? Because of course it's not the first one, is it? It's not the first one. Um, and then the third one, again, you hear, this would be moving on a bit more. This is um, uh, treble C. So this is this, this C up here. And then you've got landmark G. And I can't quite see the last one because I have something on top of it. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's treble G again. And that fourth one that you can see, you know, that is, that's what we want them to recognize that as a triad shape. Yeah, as those three. And I know, Sharon, you wanted to say something about steps and skips, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Just even using when, when I started to, just to use that language with students, because again, if you've got a book, a grade one book in front of you, if you have a look, you will notice that there are so many step shifts. So by that, I mean, it's where it's moving up or down a second. And where we're getting our students to understand that what we mean by moving either up or down a step is that it will be going from a space to the very next line. Now I know personally I've had to quantify that even further because I remember that experience of where you ask a people to write a note on a line. And when you ask them to write their name on a line, of course they don't write it with the letters going through the line. But there was that little conceptual blip that I had to kind of clarify what I meant by a note that's living on a line. Sometimes I'll actually do this, okay, so sticking my fingers in my ears, so this is the note and the line goes through it. So that's when a note is living on a line or when a note is living in a space. And even just being really clear so that the student isn't kind of second guessing what we actually mean by notes, you know, on lines or in spaces. 
um, and then what it looks like when you're moving a note. And again, I have a, a lovely big floor stave. Um, I use little erasers and different objects that they actually manipulate and use so that I'm getting um, proof of learning. You know, do they know when I say, okay, here we are, we're on the third line, can you move and put a note um, that is a step above or a step below? So they should be putting it um, in the third space if it's a step above or in the second space if it is below. And just taking lots and lots of care so that they, we really understand, that they understand. Um, and I'm just going to flip on here to the next slide. Um, and again, we've got different, um, different shapes and patterns. But again, all moving in this case, we have um, they're moving in steps and in skips. Skips, of course, is where they're recognizing that it's going from a space up or down to the next space or a line, up or down to the next line. And if you're looking at music, um, I mean, I'm looking at, Sally was talking about the minuet in the Trinity book earlier, where we're starting there. And you can see that we've got repeated notes, even that's another little concept that's really, really yeah. important that we're yeah. getting students to recognize that it's the same note. And you play that again and then looking there at where we're moving from C up to step to D up to E up to F to G. But when they're reading the shape, they're not bogged down into it's a, what is it? And that's, do you know what? I'm so guilty of that when I started teaching, that's nearly the first thing I would have got a student to do when learning a new piece. Let's call out the letter names of the notes. How unhelpful was that? Instead, when they're reading shapes and patterns, they look at that and they can see, okay, yeah. So we're going, from a C, okay, our landmark note, middle C, right up to the next landmark note of a G. We're just moving up in steps. And they just play it. I have, I have a little girl at the moment who is um, really focusing this term on our pitch reading. And it's quite amazing. I mean, I, I just, I wish I had known about it so much sooner because I remember the struggles I used to have in getting um, my pupils to read pitch um, when I was using the maths. Sure. Shall we just come out of slides for a few minutes, um, Sharon, and yeah. maybe Hannah can come back on because I can see there's lots and lots of conversations going on in oh, the gosh, chat. Yes. And I wonder whether Hannah, yeah, <laughs> Hannah could bring <laughs> us up to date in those a little bit. It's great that everybody's chatting away. And actually, I think doing what we all do best and learning from each other. So it's great. Thank you to everybody who's contributing. Hannah. There's been some great chat on how we get landmark notes to stick. So Bryony, Bryony's question is, is reading a landmark note more connected to the keyboard geography than the specific note name? Which is a good question. I hadn't thought of it that way. Sharon, Sally, have you got any thoughts on that? Can you say it again a moment? So it says, is reading a landmark note more connected to the keyboard geography than the specific note name? And she says, e.g., so long as you know that the note on that particular line is that particular key on the piano. So the connection between the I, landmark I note think that is an important connection, actually. I, I do think knowing the note name is also quite important um, because it, it will help you understand a little bit the function of that particular note within a, a particular key you know so knowing that a g and if you're in c major knowing it ultimately you know we're looking a bit ahead here but knowing that g in c major is the fifth or the so or the dominant whereas if you're in g major you and again you've still got to know it's a g then it it's it's the tonic a little bit i'm just thinking back i'm drawing a parallel to when i switched from violin to viola and for, for many years, I was just playing the shapes and the patterns on my viola. Because, <laughs> of course, I'm playing the, on the alto clef, you know. But I really, you know, I wasn't absolutely certain about which note it was I was playing um, at any one time. And it took a long time for that to, to develop. But now it has become firmer. I'm now more, much more aware of my keys and, and that key awareness. So um, that, that would be my answer to that, Sharon. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the other thing I'm just going to mention at this point is um, even what I call the clefs in, in the initial stages. So I, I was taught treble clef, but I do in the first instance, I mean, yes, they will eventually know both names, but I will introduce them to the treble clef as the G clef, because of course, 
you get them, they can love drawing it, you get them to draw and they can see, okay, it curls around the second line and the second line of the stave is G and that's hence the G clef. And again, likewise, rather than bass clef, introducing it to them as, as the F clef because then they've got that instant point of reference that when they start to draw it, it's that little dot that's on the fourth line. And of course, then they've got that point, instant point of reference. I mean, I do like what Brown is saying because I think, um, I'm sure we've all as piano teachers had that struggle where we have a student come in and they don't know which C on the piano they're meant to be yeah. on. And I do think that it is, I remember having a student for long enough that that was, that was a, a real issue. So I do think that linking it at the same time and where they're actually aware that this particular note is, you know, when we see it living here on the, on the, let's say the, the G, the treble stave, that then this is where it lives. You know, it's the G just above the middle C. Mm. I, I, I think it really highlights the fact that uh, learning the piano and teaching the piano is a really complex skill um, that there are so many elements to it and it's very easy for us as teachers to forget how many little tiny steps our students have to take in order to make um, progress that is theirs <laughs> rather than us kind of scaffolding their learning so that as long as we're there to help they can do something they can play it but actually, if we take away the scaffold, then they completely collapse. They don't understand actually what, what they were doing. They were just kind of copying what you were doing. That is often, often the case. I've, I, when I was doing my PhD, that was one of the things I could find that at grade three, after grade three, the number of, um, candidate, or number of children learning the piano dropped dramatically. And I'm pretty sure that that is because children bless them completely without knowing they are brilliant like at imitating and so they learn to imitate in a way that they don't realize and in a way that many teachers don't realize the children are just imitating and that at grade one and grade two you can get away with it grade three the demands of pieces in terms of coordination understanding of what is on the written page and memory it becomes much 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 harder to do and that's what defeats them and that's why they will give up at about grade three level because they are defeated by the amount of notation that they don't understand and how that translates to the piano they've managed to imitate you up to on the then because they have fantastic memories but if you just rely on that memory to get them past a grade one you'll find you'll lose them at grade three Absolutely. Um, I love Mackie's point as well here in the, in the chat. She said she realised that she'd spent a long time helping her pupils understand pentascales, so five note scales, major and minor, playing them in five finger position. Then they moved to grade one and had to know four scales. That leap was a big one. Mm. So the change in hand position they found very tricky as they lost the pattern that they understood from the pentascales. So it links to this third point about reading music so i think what you were saying about there being so many small steps leading up to one big step maggie pulled that out in the chat absolutely there yeah absolutely yeah thank you for that thank you so shall we talking talking about scales and keys and things should we should we move on with the fourth point of checklist you know while sharon gets set up we've had yeah. um, the first three points remember were that to make sure that your students you know how well do they play simple time rhythms in 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 four, included possibly dotted rhythms. Um, the second point was understanding and feeding time signatures and knowing um, about time signatures. And the third thing was being able to read and play pitch patterns, you know, how secure they are being able to play read and play pitch patterns before, and we're going to move on here, so sorry i just wanted to say a quick shout out to wendy because it's her very first webinar and hey. she's been putting some great um comments in the chat so before you um go back to it i just wanted to say a special hello to you hello, and if, if you're if to anybody else if this is your first one um if your first time on a webinar with us please just put it in the chat and we'll make sure that we give you a special hello yes it's great because i think we have got lots of people signed up for this for the for, which will be their first webinar so welcome um i think we fell off a little bit with all my all my sound business going on at, at the beginning didn't we um with all those welcomes a bit so let's move on because we are talking i think now about number four which is yes um 
yeah that. we've done that one yes. haven't we so on to key awareness you know are your pupils familiar with playing in the following keys you know so we're looking at c g d and f major and the a minor and the d minor and as you can see sharon's um, drawn in there some lovely i love sharon's put these together aren't they just beautiful um you can see you know we've we've got the pitch patterns there for g major and we've also got one there for, for d minor so are they able to play are they familiar with playing the pentascale the triad up down uh, or any and you know just three notes or just three notes in the middle any of these um, the five finger pattern is still quite common still quite common at grade one and we'll talk about that in a minute but of course they do need to be familiar with with going all the way up the scale as well um, and you know you can make sure that they've learned a number of pieces using these different keys that they've uh, already played some scales you know and and um, we have a, a lovely idea that we've got from Ilga Pitkevica who's one of my uh, fellow um, piano teachers course pupils where um, tutors rather and she talks about the cars and lorries which I just love and it just works a treat so there's a car there's a lorry and then it stops and all of a sudden they get that pattern of threes and fours yeah so becoming really familiar and the fingers thinking in those keys mm. and you can do that with with sight reading as well can't you Sharon you were going to talk about sight reading cards I think were you a bit here yeah, absolutely I mean I know at the minute um, with the little girl I've been talking about um, my little pupil who's just doing so well with reading patterns, the resource that I'm, I happen to be using with her um, is the Piano Safari sight reading cards. And just where everything is, we've got these lovely stages and where we're breaking it up. I mean, I remember my experience of coming to, for example, grade one sight reading, and it was just, again, a couple of weeks before the exam, and it's give it a go. <laughs> and it really does feel quite, quite possible. I mean, the other thing that's maybe worth saying at this point is, Again, just in comparison to how I used to do things, what I would have been doing was I would have been starting to prepare a student for grade one. And they may not, I mean, back even then, someone mentioned about playing pentascales to, to, to begin with. I love that idea. That's just fabulous because it's a starting point. Um, and then they've only got a couple more notes to get um, under their fingers whilst they actually deal with the complexity of, um, of getting the, the thumb under. Um, but they would have had probably none of these scales learnt. Now, the difference to, to what I do today is that when they start preparing for grade one, i.e. when they start preparing those particular three pieces, chances are they will actually already be fluently playing these scales and will have been um, using pattern cards to be playing in different keys. Again, you can see there, there is... Um, a little song um, that's based in the key of D minor. Just something simple so that they're actually getting the, um, you know, the, again, what we're talking about here is key awareness. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to uh, just re reply to Faye Dean. I think it is Faye. Um, you, you're saying you love the idea of landmark notes. If you want a bit more information on it, then head over to our Curious Piano Teachers YouTube channel and look for a series called Sparkle, which is seven short videos that will really kind of put the whole thing in con context for you. OK, Sparkle over on our YouTube channel. Um, OK, so shall we move on? And let's, because yes. I can see we could talk about this for a long time. We could talk about this one in particular <laughs> for a long time, couldn't we, Sharon? We get totally <laughs> excited about this one. Um, so this is the question, the check. Is your pupil able to make small, um, hang on a minute, I can't quite read what we, we ended up putting, <laughs> small yet confident movements out of, uh, out of five finger position. So that pentascale that we were just talking about here is that five finger position. And you'll find that students can often 
you know, play quite successfully within that five finger position. They're feeling very, very familiar, aren't they? Just going up and down those, those five notes. And they can probably even do it in contrary motion. They can even probably do. My fingers are doing their own thing there. Um, however, um, if you start to look, as we did, at the grade one music, then you can see that it actually moves students beyond five finger position. And they can struggle if they're not used to moving out of that. So this piece, for example, which isn't a grade one piece at all, but it gives you a, a, a little idea of what we mean by this. <clears throat> so this is, um, I think, a piece by, oh, I can't remember now, Ryan Agle, maybe again. You know, if you look at the complexity of that, if you look at the left hand, that's mostly in five finger position with a little extension there. Yeah, little finger has to move. And then it does this, and then this, and then this. In itself, that's not too hard at all. Yeah? There is a little bit of difficulty in, I think, going down there possibly. And then I think there's probably a little bit of difficulty going down to the fourth finger, just because it's a bit weaker. The right hand, okay, that starts in five finger, and then it moves, okay? So there we have to pick up, and we have to transfer onto our fifth finger, so we're going to need to lift. Still in the five finger position, still in the five finger position, but look what happens here second finger just goes over okay so there you've got two moves that they've got to be ready to come out of that initial five finger position and then having that in itself is a complex little idea because you're coming back on yourself fifth finger fourth finger third finger you know, and that might be one thing that I might do with a student if they were learning this, I might pull that out for them. Because then they've also got to coordinate in with that movement, the left hand coordination. So that's going to be quite tricky. This is going to be tricky. And then. Now, what all those things do is if they're having to think about them lots and lots because their hands together too soon or they're trying to play too fast which they all do to be honest don't they you know um it's going to give them brain overload brain overload you cannot do two things at the same time you cannot think sorry you can do two things you can't think two things at the same time so they've got to be really secure in what each hand is doing separately and this hand in particular has got to be able to do that like I'm doing now whilst I'm talking to you, yeah? So I would say to a pupil, if they're going, I can do this, I say, okay, could you play the right hand? And could you tell me what you had for your lunch as you play? And you'll find that they go, <laughs> and they, they often can't do it because it, again, it gives them brain overload, yeah? Now, if they can do it and they can tell me what they've had for lunch, then it means the fingers have learnt that automatic pattern because that is what you're aiming for, this automaticity, okay? We go through these three stages of learning, the cognitive stage where you have to work really hard, think about it, and then you have an associative stage where the learning begins to fit together, they begin to see the patterns, and then the automatic stage where it's literally a no-brainer. And it has to be a no-brainer hand separately because they will then have to go back to the cognitive stage to put that together, okay? So these are the problems that you face when students are having to move out of a five-finger position more than they've done in the past. And if they're not doing that fairly confidently, then you will struggle when it comes to the grade one pieces because on the whole, they will do, <laughs> they will, um, they, they, they'll, they'll just find it too hard for them to do. Sharon. Yeah. I mean, just to give you, to kind of get back and talk about some of the pieces that I'm sure you indeed know. I mean, thumb passing um, over or under, under, we've got Happy Day, for example, from ABRSM. Um, 
again, both the minuets that are in, um, there's a minuet in Trinity and there's also a minuet in G um, in LCM. Uh, extended hand positions, um, including stretching between the fingers, for example, ABRSM, you've got that in the echo. Um, the other okay, let me just let me just find that one and give people a bit of a, an example of what we mean. Um, and in fact, what I'll do, hang on a minute, folks, I'll just drop my camera down so you can see oh, the keyboard for a bit. Yeah. Okay. I think you can just about see. So, extended um, hand position we're talking about, aren't we? Yeah. So, for example, in um, yeah, in bar four. Just going down five, four, two, one. So basically, it is a triad shape, but they've got the B added to it there. Okay, yeah. and you've got the same thing. Of course, they're just they're just triads, really, being filled in here. But it's out of a five finger shape. It is slightly extended, and the left hand in particular has got chords that are definitely out of that five finger position. Not hard to play those chords, but nevertheless, they're far away from the five finger position. What was another one you mentioned, Sharon? The old one. Um, I could even go on and look yep. at some of the other ones. Um, I mean, one thing that we noticed, for example, was that, you know, in terms of, you know, fingering patterns for scales and broken chords and arpeggios, you know, like all pieces, it's, it, that's, that's a common thing. Um, increased rhythmical playing. Um, when passing from hand to hand was another. Mm -hmm. um, so there is in ABRSM, um, we said mice, um, nice. Trinity, hand in hand, and LCM, they have a study there, um, the wind. And again, you've got the, the rhythmical playing, um, the need for that. Shall I, shall, I just, shall I just play a little bit of those? So who said mice, rhythmical playing, passing between hand to, from hand to hand? So this is one, two, three, four. There's left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, together. Yeah, that's what we mean there. And you were saying uh, the wind. Wait, oh, I love this piece. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the wind is a fun piece. Oh, it's so lovely, yes. Um, so this starts with the left hand. So that's left hand, right hand left hand and getting that evenness of rhythm one and two and three and four and one and two and three so this passing rhythmically from hand to hand is actually quite a big feature of grade one work i would say yeah um and i know we're i think we're giving you the the idea here of all the things that actually you can look for to work out whether your students are able to make these just small but but confident movements out of that five finger pattern. Yeah, and I'm just. Should we say, move on? Yes, we will indeed. I'm just going to say number six to Maggie there, who um, was asking about the wind. It's this study um, at um, it's in LCM. LCM. But it's also available in a separate book. Uh, which is beautiful um, and love she, she writes some lovely lovely pieces um, I just can't quite remember what it's called at the moment but it is I might try and find that in a minute um, it's on the, it's available via the piano safari site actually her it books is. are yes, it through is. a child's mm. window or something like that it's called okay so moving on oh yes we've got the lollipop sticks I love this picture Sharon um, because this is now all about the dynamic contrast and the ability of your students to be able to tell the story in other words to be able to go beyond the notes yeah, it it's because yeah. it's you know the, the what's on the page is just the starting point isn't it yeah. and um to to engage your pupil and their imagination by getting them to think about how they can bring the piece of music to life the wind for example you know what a great title can you hear you know where is the wind what's it doing and and how are you going to play it and I, you know th this too often gets left till the end yeah. um and is then kind of bolted onto the piece yeah. instead of being an in integral heart part of it and i love actually sally what you've just been talking about you know those those three stages you know you've got the cognitive and then it's the mm. point where it's kind of getting going but it's getting it to that place where 
all of those things are automatic. And I know oh, yeah. certainly years ago when I was first entering students for exams, I was a very novice piano teacher. The number of, you know, the, the kind of the, the panic that everyone gets mm -hmm. into because the notes mightn't even be there. And of course, then there's no chance of any story being told because there's just so much concern and worry. Not, not, and we're not just talking here about the student and their parent, we're talking about us as teachers. And I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm mean. stressful, isn't it? Quite stressful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we, you know, we've all experienced that feeling of stress from oh they haven't got the notes together you know let alone as you as you've just rightly pointed out you know adding getting all into the what really makes the music come to life and actually the most enjoyable bit you know isn't it fun just to tweak with them these little bits when they're through all the difficulties then they can begin to feel that they're they're musicians and sadly it that often doesn't quite happen or it only happens the day before the exam. And so, you know, the exam is the only ex experience they have of, of understanding the music in a deep, different and deeper way. And of course, by then they're often, if they've, if they've come up and been struggling, they're so fed up with the exam pieces, all they want to do is, you know, put them in the bin or something like that, instead of really enjoying the development of the performance aspect, which I know we're going to talk about in our, in the course that we're going to be running soon, isn't it? You know, we're going to talk about how you can develop the performance aspect so that these are real pieces of music as opposed to um, just pieces that they learn for an exam. Yeah. Uh, so shall we move on? Because I know we, we did start a little late and we're, we're running a little behind time. Um, so I think the second, the seventh and last part of the checklist is having been through all that checklist with them, uh, that you then turn to the student, they've gone through all those, they, you have discussed along the way how they are their rhythms, how good they are their note reading and shapes and patterns, how well they understand and their fingers are thinking in those keys, how much they, they've explored the dynamic contrasts and the, the stories of the pieces that they've been learning. Okay, that's been an ongoing discussion in a lesson as you, as you have been going through the checklist. So the last part of the checklist is to find out really whether they are ready to do grade one, whether they want to indeed, you know. Um, are you prepared to do more piano practice each week starting now? And I will often say um, to students that, oh, this is where you are. In order to take the exam this, this term, um, you will need to do 30 hours practice between then and now. Yeah, 30 hours. Because actually, once you break down 30 hours, it actually, over a number of weeks, it, it's very manageable. Yeah, very manageable indeed. Does the student understand that they have got still quite a lot of work to do, that this is really upping their game in a very, very different way? Um, do they know that they've got our support? That's important. They know that we are with them. We're not against them. We're not pushing them through something that they don't want to do. They have our support. And the parents also need to understand that they need to give support as well, because there will be times when the pupil crashes, they're too tired, they don't want to go and do their piano practice, and the parent has to be that adult in the situation and know how to respond to that. Do they really want to get better at playing the piano, or are they happy where they are? Yeah, that's a nice question to ask, really. And do they think, based on all the evidence, of your discussions, do they think they're ready to start preparing for grade one? And this is an ongoing, I think, discussion that you can have with your student. As I say, probably over two or three weeks, you might get through this, this checklist. Um, Sharon. Yeah. Well, what I like about this is, it's just what we're saying here, people commitment. And it's actually helping them to understand, putting them fully in the picture, giving them a bird's eye view what this actually means mm -hmm. rather than us being in that situation of three weeks before the exam suddenly having to have a panic talk to the parent about what needs to happen if this is going if this exam is going to be passed and it's about staging everything out so that that basically doesn't happen um, and I do find that 
the more I kind of do this. And I'm not saying that I get it, and I'm sure Sally would agree that we get it right every time, but it's, it's this awareness and understanding of the sorts of things that we need to do. You know, So we need to, to get people on board with the commitment. We need to have that conversation with parents, not just three weeks before the exam, but many, many months before the exam, where mm. everyone gets to see where they're at. Again, for example, and we will be um, supplying this as a resource. I'm actually just going to click onto um, the next little bit just to invite you, if you haven't already signed up for our weekly e-newsletter, um, to, to do that. Because next Wednesday, we will be sending out uh, a PDF resource with this that you can actually sit down in a lesson, or as I just said, even a couple of lessons, and work through this. Um, with your students or indeed again with maybe those parents who have been asking about when they will be the, their child will be ready to take grade one and where you then have some concrete solid evidence about whether or not they're ready you can be then identifying the areas that you know let's say they're not ready well let's see what are the areas that they're really struggling with pitch reading might be one maybe it's to do with the rhythm whatever it is Maybe they need to be, you know, starting to, to, to work in more keys, apply more skills. You've actually got some sort of a starting point that you as the teacher can then build on and go forwards. And where then you can, you can still ask for that commitment. It's like, okay, so let's see, you know, in maybe six or eight weeks time, let's see where, where we can be. Let's see how much improved your your pitch reading can can be yeah it gives something really really tangible doesn't it to to work towards and uh something you know that that, that everybody can understand and i would really i know parents continue to, to sort of raise their heads in these discussions and my parents have been mentioned several times here I really, really recommend you getting parents around for a coffee mm. or a cup of tea and sitting down with them away from the piano lesson itself, having a, trying to have a conversation about this as the lesson ends and the next lesson begins, or even actually as the child is in the room. I'm not saying the child isn't part of the conversation, but sometimes you do need to go adult to adult on this. You know, as, as an example, um, I've taken on a, a new transfer student last term and um, the, the mum came round for a, a coffee a couple of weeks ago and he's like, he's like a boy transformed uh, as a result because of our discussion and because of the understanding that mum and I had built up and oh yeah, we're all working together on this, yeah? So it can make a huge difference and to sit down and to explain to parents that these are, this is what's needed. This is where your child needs to be. Let, let's think about whether they're there or not, shall we? Shows you as the professional rather than somebody who is just kind of, you know, doing this because it's a bit of fun. It shows that you have thought about this carefully and it shows that you care, to be honest as well. And I find that the majority of parents really respect that, really do, and value it. Okay, so let's... Yes, our new online course that's coming soon. I think we, we, we're just going to wrap up now, I think, with a little, little thing about this. As Sharon said, um, we'd like, do sign up for our weekly e-newsletter that we send out every Wednesday, um, the Curiosity Zone. And in that, we will be sending out details about our new grade one toolkit for piano teachers. We've talked about lots today in a very kind of general and broad way. And actually in this new online course, we're really going to be digging down into the, uh, the detail a little bit more, aren't we, Sharon? We and are. it's going to have sort of four hours, four hours of videos and we're going to have some, some worksheets and things like that. So as we've said, we're very excited by the creation of it, really. So what will happen next is we will be sending out later on today an email to everyone who has registered for this webinar. Inside that, there will be a link uh, if you do not currently receive the Curiosity Zone, which is our weekly e-newsletter. Uh, and when you sign up to, to that, it just means that we will be sending out more information um, and that link to, um, to get 
involved with that course when that becomes available. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's imagining what it's going to be like when you get students who are coming out of an exam um, and going, you know, that was, that was fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I mean, the other thing that you can maybe imagine parents saying is, you know, thank you so much for all the care that you've, you've taken in preparing, you know, Anna or whoever it is so thoroughly that, you know, this whole exam experience, they've, they've just taken it in their stride. Um, and so I'm just going to finish with this, which is just to outline what you can expect from this short um, course that we are in the process of creating at the minute. Um, so it's called Grade 1 Toolkit for Piano Teachers, going to help you find out whether or not the pupil is ready to start Grade 1 preparation. This webinar is, is just really the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, Sally has already been just there talking about the parents, so there'll be a little bit more practical advice and ideas of exactly what you can get going on to get them involved. You will also, with this course, have access to a range of practical, tried and tested teaching strategies um, to cover the requirements for each of the three main exam boards. So um, that's LCM, ABRSM and Trinity. Um, and thirdly, you'll know how to guide and support pupils immediately before the exam so that they can achieve their best. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we end up so much involved in the actual process of teaching that we kind of forget, and I think Sally again is, has, just, has just touched on this, um, you know, that really the exam should not be where they first perform. Practicing is one thing, playing is another, performing is something else, and where we should be building in these opportunities several weeks before they actually have their exam points. So there's so much that they can be doing. There is, so, yeah, absolutely. And we do, we do, thank you, Sharon. We, and we, we don't think there's another course like this, actually, um, out there. And so this is why, partly why we're, we're very excited ourselves, because we're discovering we learn as much as we teach. Um, and I think, you know, to, to be able to break all this down, because we know that there's a lot of people who, who are asking for help on this and how to teach. So we're really hoping that we can, we can help all you, because that's what we love doing most of all. And, you know, we love the idea of, of, of you sort of having, putting your, your students in for exams and feeling confident, really, in knowing that your students have learnt so much more than just three pieces and scales, yeah? Because the, learning the piano is, touches lives and it is so much more than just the exam experience. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you both so much. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today, who's um, been putting notes in the chat, especially it's w w been wonderful to have some new people on the call today. Special shouts out to Natalia Lanceman, Vivian Jackson and Hannah Luckins. Lovely to have you for the first time here as well. Um, so please do look out for that email that's going to come your way explaining how you can sign up and find out a little bit more about this. But I just want to say thank you again to Sally and Sharon. Um, happy teaching, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Have a great Bye. day. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye. Bye.